Hello all, here is a brief introduction to annotation in English 3. I know that you have probably been shown many different ways to annotate, but we're going to do a certain method of annotation in here so that we all are on the same page and we all can learn together how to properly annotate. Real quick, an annotation is a note of explanation or comment added to a text or diagram. Often people assume that just highlighting or underlining things is an annotation, and that is not so. An annotation must also include a comment or an explanation of why you highlighted that thing. A big rule in this class, and from now on, forever, in any English or class where you need to annotate in college, and a highlight is not an annotation. If you turn in something that's supposed to be annotated and it is only highlighted, it will get a zero because that is not an annotation. You could literally just go through and highlight random stuff and call it an annotation if that were true. How you will annotate. Every time you make a highlight, you will add a note to the highlight. So this might be pen and paper. So anytime you highlight or underline something, you will make a note out to the side in the margins. Or if you're on a computer, you would be in a Google Doc most likely. You will highlight using the highlight tool and then make a comment next to it using the comment tool. It will not be considered an annotation unless you put a note with it. Now, the note to your annotation is not just rephrasing what you highlighted. It is explaining why you highlighted what you highlighted. You're not just restating it. You are explaining why you highlighted that. If you highlight something and you don't know why, you probably shouldn't be highlighting it. So let's go over, is it an annotation? First one, we have the first sentence highlighted. So it is not an annotation. There is no comment to accompany it. We have the sentence, these are the times that try men's souls, the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country, but he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of a man and woman. There is no note, so it's not a, it is not an annotation. The next one, the same sentence highlighted, but next to it I've added an annotation and I've said this is a main idea. He is encouraging people to fight by attacking their manliness. He is suggesting only those who fight deserve attention while those who don't are pansies. I've added a note. And it's not just restating what's highlighted. So yes, this is an annotation. The next one is just a word highlighted. So this is in fact not an annotation. However, on this slide, I've highlighted the same word, but I have made a comment and I have identified the definition of that word and given a common synonym that everyone understands. So that is in fact an annotation. Okay, so you have an annotation guide in this class, and if you remember back from your first day in class, I told you you would need these five colors, whether it's a highlighter, pen, colored pencil, marker, whatever it was, you needed these five colors. You need blue, pink, yellow, green, and orange. Blue, you will highlight claims or main ideas for informational text in blue. Or if we're reading a fiction text, you will highlight the theme in blue. In pink, you will highlight any support for the main ideas or themes. So if you have a whole paragraph, you would highlight the claim and then any support that backs up that claim as in evidence, you would put in pink. Yellow, you will highlight unknown words. So any words that you do not know the exact definition of, you will highlight them in yellow. In green, that is for literary devices, and we'll go over them shortly. And orange is diction, and diction is simply strong words. We'll go over diction shortly as well. First one is claims and themes, which will be in blue. Now, claims, main ideas, those are interchangeable words. So if you've heard main ideas or claims, either one's correct. Uh, claims and main ideas, that would be for nonfiction texts like speeches. Uh, they usually have several main ideas throughout the text. So many speeches, each paragraph or every few paragraphs has a main idea. When you highlight a main idea, 
you will need to simplify the main idea by putting it in your own words. And then you will also need to assess what kind of reaction the author wants to get out of the audience. When you highlight a main idea in your comment, you need to put what the author, what reaction the author wants from the, the audience, especially in speeches. The, usually in speeches, authors are trying to get the audience to do something. So what reaction is the author trying to get? You need to note that for it to be an annotation. For themes, I am not looking for thematic statements. A theme is not just one word. That is a thematic topic. We are looking for thematic statements. So if you're thinking of a word, ask yourself, what is the author trying to teach us about that word? You have to remember themes are universal and not specific to the characters or the events of the text you are talking about. Usually themes are not found explicitly in the text. You may need to type or write your theme in the margins and then highlight it in blue. Fiction texts of this level, meaning the English 3 level, have more than one theme. So we're going to start when we first start annotating fiction by finding two themes. You cannot assume that they are only getting one message across. It's usually multiple messages that they are trying to get across to the reader. You have to remember about fiction. If you say there's no theme, someone did not sit down and write 150 pages about something if they didn't feel that they could teach somebody something. So remember, there is more than one theme. And themes are not you statements and they can be debated. They are not duh statements. A theme would not be the sky is blue. That is a duh statement. They can be debated. So let's go over. Is it a theme? Love. Love is not a theme because it is only one word. If we say love leads Romeo to death, that is still not a theme because it is too specific to the story Romeo and Juliet. If we say immature love has disastrous consequences, this is a theme because it relates to the story. It's a lesson we learn about love, but it is not explicitly talking about Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. Perseverance leads Odysseus to success. This is not a theme because it is explicitly saying Odysseus's name. If we say hate cannot drive out hate, this is a theme. It is a theme that we actually, and actually a line from MLK's I Have a Dream speech or from him in general, but it is not explicit to one specific text and it is a lesson and we could also debate it if we chose to. You should not be a hypocrite. This is not a theme because it is a you statement, how it starts with you. You have to remember that we are not using you statements. It cannot start with you. Jealousy is bad. Now, this is debatable on whether, whether it's a theme or not. I would say it's not a theme because it is a duh statement. Jealousy is bad. It, that's pretty, that's a given. So if we were to create a thematic statement for each of these, you could go through and without using a you statement or making it super um, specific to one text, you could make a thematic statement out of each of these thematic topics. So remember, a theme is not just one word. The next thing you'll highlight in pink, and I know this looks a little purple, but we're going to call it pink is support for claims and themes, meaning evidence. If we were writing an essay, we would go to the pink to find evidence. This is your most important annotation. You will need it to explain how the evidence supports the main idea or theme. When you highlight something in pink, you need to explain how that something supports what you put in blue, the theme or the main idea. Do not just restate what you highlighted. If your comment that you put does not answer the question how, it is not an annotation. So we will practice this a lot. 
In yellow, unknown words. This one's pretty straightforward. Simply highlight and provide a synonym that can easily take the place of the word. You need to watch for parts of speech. Your synonym in your comment should be the same part of speech as the word that you highlighted. And you should be able to take that unknown word and directly replace it with your synonym and the sentence completely makes sense. Diction is in orange. Diction is just a fancy way to say words. And when we say we're looking for diction, we're looking for powerful words. And we are also looking at connotation. Connotation is the positive or negative feeling that we get from words. It's not their dictionary definition. It's how we feel about that word. So when you highlight diction, you will need to note what emotion the word gets from the reader or the audience. So what reaction does the reader or audience have to these strong words? So words with strong diction or connotation. COVID-19, a couple months ago that did not have a strong connotation, but now it does. The word vomit could have a strong emotional reaction for people. Red, the color red, if an author is repeating red as a universal color, that would be considered a strong connotation because red has either positive or negative depending on what role it's in. Frightened, that could be a word with strong connotation. Or Kobe. Um, recent events, Kobe, saying Kobe could have a strong connotation for people. In green, you are going to highlight literary devices. Now, I know you've probably gone over some literary devices, but there's some biggies that you need to look out for, and we're going to talk about those. So, when you annotate a literary device, you need to identify the literary device in your comments explain why the author uses that literary device and the effect the literary device has on the audience. Some top literary devices to focus on, simile and metaphor, allusion, foreshadowing, ethos, pathos, logos, personification, and the rest of the list. We're going to go over each of these so that you have an idea and kind of remember what they are. So simile metaphor. A simile is simply a comparison using like or as. His problems are as large as the ocean. So if we were going to annotate that, the literary device is a simile. Why does the author use the literary device? To tell us how big his problems feel to him. And then what effect does that have on the audience? It makes us aware and might even stress us out that his problems are so big. Also, his heart burned for her like that of a million suns. We have another simile. Metaphor is a comparison without like or as. Tom's eyes were ice as he stared her down. Now, if we're annotating this, this is a metaphor. Why is the author using this? To give us a feel for Tom's feelings. How does the audience react to this? Well, we might say Tom, we are now aware that Tom is angry or not in a happy emotion. And we might start to it add suspense for us. Also, chaos is a friend of mine. It is comparing chaos to a friend. That is also a metaphor. Next is illusion. A illusion, not illusion with an I. An illusion is a reference to a well-known text, story, event, or person. So some examples of illusion. He's no Romeo. We're referring to the story Romeo and Juliet but we are really meaning that someone that we are talking about is not uh, romantic. We could say this place is as perfect as the Garden of Eden. This is a simile, but it's also alluding to a story um, in the Christian Bible. See, she is such an Einstein. This is alluding to Einstein, who we all know is a very smart person, so you have to remember for it to be an illusion, it needs to be well known. Cookies are Miss Landry's Achilles heel. Here we're alluding to Achilles and the story of his Achilles heel, his weak spot. So we would mean cookies are Miss Landry's weakness. Foreshadowing. We know what this is. It gives hints or suggestions about what is to come later in the story or speech. We could look at the prologue for Romeo and Juliet. It literally tells the audience that Romeo and Juliet will both die. 
then Shakespeare, Shakespeare mentions death throughout the whole play. That is foreshadowing. Now, while foreshadowing is mainly found in fiction texts, speakers sometimes foreshadow what they will talk about later in the speech. Ethos, pathos, logos. You learn this in 10th grade, um, unless maybe your semester was cut short and you didn't get to this part. But ethos is credibility. So the author is building credibility that's usually in speeches. An example of that is a national board certified doctor speaking about cancer research. They are credible. They are a national board certified doctor, so they know what they're talking about. Pathos is emotions. Pathos are the, is, is the strongest use of rhetoric when you're trying to convince someone to do something. It is easy to make people feel things. So pathos is emotion. Logos is logic. Using results from a two-year scientific study to prove your point. That is logos because you're giving solid facts and numbers and figures. Often this is used in speeches. The next one is personification. This is giving lifelike qualities to inanimate objects. We pretty much, we know personification. We could say the, tra the trees danced in the evening breeze. Trees don't actually dance, so we're giving lifelike qualities to inanimate objects. The wind howled. Wind does not verbally howl. The sun shone brightly on the audience. This one is personification because it, the sun, an inanimate object, is doing an active thing such as shining. Then we have imagery. Imagery is just describing something in great detail and activating all the senses. Often in fiction, this will be at the beginning of the story um, or may just set the scene, but then it can be found throughout to describe what's going on. As he opened the door, the warm smell of vanilla and cinnamon filled his nostrils. The faint sound of music could be heard over the whispered singing of his mother. As he bent to drop his bags, he felt the warm softness that could only be his cat, Lucy. As the feeling of Lucy's purr filled his fingertips, Sam, Sam finally felt the comfort of being home. In this short paragraph, we are activating all the senses. We have the smell of vanilla. We have the sound of music. We're feeling this cat. Um, these are, this is describing a scene for us. Repetition is what it says. It is repeating the same thing over and over again to get a point across. If an author keeps repeating something, it's important, whether fiction or nonfiction. So MLK's I have a dream speech, he repeats I have a dream over and over again. Your job is to note why they're repeating this. And rhetorical questions. These are questions the author asks the audience that are not meant to be answered aloud. These can be in speeches or in fiction. They are meant to make the reader or audience think about what the author is saying. For example, so why do people follow the pack no matter how ridiculous it seems? Perhaps it's not so much about good and evil, right and wrong, smart or stupid. It might be, as Burns' experiments suggest, that our brains get confused between what it sees and what others tell us. So again, he starts with a question, this article does, letting us think about the answer and then they're giving us the answer. They don't always give the answer, but sometimes they do. And that is the end of annotations. I know this seems like a lot. We are going to practice it over and over again until we get it right. You will now complete an annotation worksheet to help you practice annotating. And then we'll also work on literary devices a little bit later.